Good madam. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, madam. Oh, where are you visiting today, Dorothy? I'm trying to understand the art in Rome. That's very praiseworthy of you, my dear. I hope when we return home I can be more useful to you and be able to enter a little into what interests you. Oh, Dr. my dear. Well, the notes I've made here will want sifting. You could, if you please, extract them uh, under my direction. Well, perhaps now that you have finished your researches, you can begin to write the book that will make your knowledge useful to the world. Well, my dear, I think you may rely upon me for knowing the times and seasons adapted to the various stages of a work. Well, it is not to be measured by the facile conjecture of ignorant onlookers. But your notes at Loic already represent years of work. Well, my dear Dorothea, it is always a child of the intelligence to be mocked by the ceaseless chatter of those who attempt only the smallest achievement. Well, they are indeed equipped for no other. I have seen the rows of notebooks which you have said wanted digesting. You have spoken of the book that is to be published, and you have said that with my help you are ready to begin the work which has been your lifelong study. Those are the simple facts. I ask only to be of use to you. I wish you a good morning, Edward. My guide is waiting for me. Dorothea, I would be most grateful. Should Mr. Ladislaw call, that you will not receive him alone, as you did yesterday during my absence. Mr. Ladislaw called to pay his respects to you. I did what I thought to be my duty as your wife. I do not care to trust your delicate inexperience to a mind such as my cousin's. I find Mr. Ladislaw's mind interesting and stimulating. It is like mine, eager and curious for improvement. I find he has an honest appraisal of his abilities and talents. What took the talk is up and down the town? You, the weak candidate for Middlemarch. Well, I have been invited. Uh, been invited, you know. I should have thought standing for Parliament is the most expensive hobby in the world. I have not said that I am going to stand. And, and I have not said that I am not going to stand. But do you think of what you are doing? Sir James will make an excellent match for tea. And Sir James will not like you going in with the wings. Sir James and Celia are very fond. Dorothea and Casabon are fond. The devil has his own way sometimes. Now, Brooke, they say that the last Whig candidate in Middlemarch spent £10,000 and failed because he did not bribe enough. There's a bitter reflection for a man. Well, the Tories bribe, you know. Treaties, hot condoms, that sort of thing. And they bring the voters drunk to the poll. <laughs> yes, but they're not going to have it all their own way in future. We are a little backward in Middlemarch, I admit, but... Uh, we shall uh, educate them. We shall uh, bring them on. Yes, but think of Celia Doom. What an excellent thing it would be. Your two estates together. Well, it, it would be an excellent match, certainly. But uh, I thought Celia might like Lidgate. Lidgate? But the man hasn't got a penny to dress himself with. Oh, well, he has got his way to make, certainly. No, look, really. You've had one bad marriage in the family. Don't have another one. You see, she is not here. No. For why do you think she will be? I think she will. When I met her, I thought she must have no feeling. Why so? Because I thought only a woman without feeling could marry my cousin. But she is a Madonna. The Madonna I need for my picture. Perhaps it may see her 
Mr. Foley. Uh, now, Mrs. Casabon is not a model. So, Mrs. Casabon is not a model. But uh, she's not disagreeable. No, she's not disagreeable. I saw that yesterday. So I asked myself, now, why did she marry him? It must be because she is a clever woman, an intellectual woman. And she is not? Nothing of the kind. She has simplicity and great fear. She's the angel of the guile. I think you are in love with the Lady Cutter. <laughs> I would like to carry her away. Where to? To uh, a Grecian island, a paradise. What does it matter so long as I could teach her what she wants to know? How to understand that picture? How to understand the meaning of love. Where's well, Fred? So where else would he be at this hour of the morning except in bed, Papa? They don't take her off from me, not when it comes to work. Not like you, does it? I prefer not to be idle, Papa. Where's well, Fred? I've got to speak to your Uncle Dalton about this affair of Fred's. Are you sure Mary Garth never said Mrs. Wall had named Bulstrode? Why, certainly, Papa. She said only that Mrs. Wall had complained that Fred was unsteady. Oh, he'll settle. Well, I do hope he will, Papa. Oh, Papa. Yes, Susie? Wouldn't it be a kindness if you asked Dr. Lidgett to dinner? He can hardly know anyone in Middlemarch, and I do think it would be a kindness. Yes, of course, Rosie. You always were the one to think about us, hmm? I cannot persuade you to adopt my regimen. No, 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 no. I have no opinion of that system. Life needs its comfort. Gluttony is the work of the devil. No doubt. But uh, what I came here to talk to you about was a, a little affair of my friends. Vincy, you know what I think. You were not warranted in devoting money to an expensive education which has done nothing but give him extravagant and idle habits. Well, as to that, Bulford, I could not foresee a fall in the trade. There wasn't a sign of this was in Middlemarch, and the lad was clever. Well, I think I was justified in what I tried to do for Fred. A man shouldn't try to carve out his meat to an ounce beforehand. One should trust a little to Providence. I don't wish to act otherwise than as your best friend in say. When I say that what you have been uttering just now is one mass of worldliness and inconsistent folly. Very well, I don't profess to be anything else but worldly. What's more, I don't suppose you conduct your business on what you call unworldly principles. The only difference that I see it is that one form of worldliness is a bit more honest than another. This kind of discussion is unfruitful, Vincent. You have some particular business? Well, the long and the short of it is, somebody's been telling old Featherston, giving you as the authority, but Fred has been borrowing, or trying to borrow money, on the prospect of his uncle's land. Of course, you never said any such nonsense. But the old man will insist that Fred brings up a bit of a note in your handwriting saying you don't believe any such thing. I suppose you can have no objection to that. Pardon me, I have an objection. I'm by no means sure that your son, in his recklessness and ignorance, has not tried to raise money by holding out his future prospects. The printer says lacks money lending. Is Fred right gives me his word. He has never tried to borrow money on the prospect of his uncle's land. He's not a liar. I'm not at all sure that I should be befriending your son by smoothing his way to the future possession of Featherson's property. I cannot regard wealth as a blessing to those who use it simply as a harvest for this world. Peter Featherson's property will not tend to your son's eternal welfare or to the glory of God. If you mean to hinder everybody from having money except saints and evangelists, then you must give up some profitable partnership. That's all I can say. You pain me very much by speaking in this way, Vincent. It's not an easy thing to thread a path of righteousness through the temptations of the world. Well, no doubt it's difficult for some. You must remember, if you please, that I stretch my tolerance toward you as my wife's brother. And if it will become you to complain of me as withholding material help towards the worldly position of your family, I must remind you that it is not your own prudence or judgment that has enabled you to keep your place in the trade. You'll be no loser by my business. You'll reckon a fine rate of interest. If you want to see my family come down in the world, you'd better say so. Shall you come down in the world for what is this letter about your son? Well, whether or no, I think it's very unhandsome of you to refuse it. You might as well slander, Fred. It comes to pretty much the same thing when you refuse to say you didn't let a slander going. Vincent, if you insist on quarrelling with me, it will be exceedingly painful to Harriet as well as myself. 
It is wanting to play bishop and banker that makes your name stink. I thought you might be. I wanted to see if I could see what you said I should. Can you? No. This immense expanse of art seems to me outside life. It is not. I suppose I am dull about many things. I should have expected you to be sensitive to the beautiful everywhere. I cannot enjoy it. And I feel that most of our lives couldn't be much uglier and more bungling than these pictures. Could they be put on the wall? You're too young to have such thoughts. You speak as if you'd never had any youth. Now you're going back to be shut up in that stone prison at Loic. It makes me savage to think of it. Look, I would rather never have met you than think of you at such a prospect. Loic is my chosen life. Yes. I wanted to ask you about something you said. Perhaps it was your lively way of speaking. I noticed that you like to put things strongly. What was it? I have a tongue which catches fire as it goes. I dare say I shall have to retract. I mean what you said about Mr. Casabon's work. Ah. The subject Mr. Casabon has chosen is as changing as a chemistry. New discoveries are constantly making new points of view. But there are many valuable books about antiquities which were written a long time ago by scholars who knew nothing about these modern things and they are still used. No. Oh, well, why should not Mr. Casabon's be valuable like that? Do you not see that it is no use living in a, in a lumber room and furbishing up old-fashioned theories? How can you bear to speak so lightly? I wonder it does not affect you more painfully if you should think that a man like Mr. Casabon should fail in his life's work. I know you question me on a point of fact, not of feeling. But I am not in a position to express my feeling towards Mr. Casabon. It would be at best a pensioner's eulogy. Can you excuse me? I realize I'm at fault having introduced the subject, but I, I understood that you... you spoke so forcibly about Mr. Casabon because of your concern for him. I know that you're grateful to him for his generosity. Yes. But perhaps Mr. Casabon's generosity has been damaging to me. I mean to renounce the liberty it has given me. I mean to go back to England, make my own way, depend on nobody but myself. It is fine. I respect that feeling. But Mr. Casabon, I'm sure, has never thought of anything except your future. I'm so glad we met him, Rome. I wanted you to know that. I've made you angry. You must think ill of me. No, oh, not at all. I like you very much. I'm interested to see what you will do now that you've decided not to be a, a painter. I'm sure you will do some great good in the world. It is no use trying to do good in the world. You're doing that when you feel delight in art or anything else. Landscape, music, poetry. The best piety is to enjoy when you can. Perhaps you'd be a poet. No, I'd only be a poet if I could dedicate my poems to you. 
<laughs> what very kind things you say to me. I wish I could always be the slightest service to you. But I shall never have the opportunity. I shall never see you again. Well, I shall always remember the well you wish that. There is one thing you can do. Promise me that you will never speak to anyone about Mr. Casabon's writing. I mean in that way. Certainly I can promise you that. Goodbye. Trust you had a satisfactory day, my dear? Yes. I'm so sorry I spoke so hastily to you this morning. I was wrong. Well, I'm glad you feel that. I fear I hurt you and made the day more burdensome. I confess your words caused me some agitation. Do you forgive me? My dear. Who with repentance is not satisfied, who is not of heaven or earth. You're upset. I too am suffering the consequences of too much mental disturbance. I will, if you wish, uh, summon your maid. No. No, I'm, I'm quite well, thank you. Your uh, visit to the gallery this morning, was that edifying? Yes. But I believe Mr. Ladislaw thinks me a heretic about art. Ladislaw? Yes, he was in the gallery. I'm sure you will think better of him when I tell you that he means to give up his dependence on your generosity. And go back to England and work his way. I told him that you would be pleased with his resolve. Did he mention the precise order of occupation to which he would commit himself? No. But he did say he felt the dangers which lay for him in your generosity. Of course, he will write to you about it. I shall await his communication on the subject. I said that I felt sure that the only thing you considered and all you did for him was his future. I had a duty towards him, my dear. Otherwise, I confess that young man is not an object of interest to me. Uh, nor need we, I think, discuss his future. It is not for us to determine. I think it is time to dress. Under the circumstances, I will not decline to state my conviction that it is unreasonable to presume that a young man of sense and character would attempt to borrow money on such terms. Ah, every gentleman doesn't say you are a young man of sense and character. Mark you that, sir. <laughs> I distinctly affirm that I never made any statements to this effect that your son had borrowed money on any property that might accrue to him on Mr. Featherston's demise. <laughs> Rest my heart, <laughs> property, accrue, demise. The fellow couldn't write finer if he wanted to borrow. <laughs> well, you don't suppose I believe a thing just because Bolstrode sits it out fine? You wish to have the letter, sir. I should think Mr. Bowstrode's denial is as good as Mrs. Wall's accusation. Oh, every bit is. But I never said I believed either one nor the other. <laughs> and now what do you expect, eh? I expect nothing, sir. I came to bring you the letter. If you like, I'll bid you good morning. No, 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 not yet, not yet. No. I, uh, <clears throat> I suppose you think that I'm going to give you a little fortune, eh? Not at all, sir. 
You were good enough of speaking in the other day of making me a little present, else, of course, I should not have thought of the matter. Mm. Thank you very much. Oh, come, isn't it worth your while, can't it? <laughs> you take money like a lord. I suppose you lose it like money. I thought I was not to look a gift horse in the mouth, sir. Mm. But I should be happy to come. Mm. Very handsome of you, sir. <laughs> I think it is handsome. I think it is. I saw you, sir. I'm very grateful. Mm, and so you should be. You want to cut a fine figure in the world. And I reckon Peter Featherstone's the only one you've got to trust to. Yes, you are men of be more cramped than I have. Mm. I haven't even got a decent hunter. Oh, well, you'll be able to buy yourself a fine hunter now. <laughs> Eighty pounds should be enough for that, I reckon. And you'll have twenty pounds for any little scrape you got into. You're very good to me, sir. Yes. Rather a better uncle than your fine uncle Bulstrode, I think. You not get much out of his speculations, I think. Hmm. You've got a pretty strong string round your father's leg, by what I hear. My eh? father never tells me anything about his affairs, sir. Well, he shows some sense there. <laughs> But others find it out without his telling. <laughs> He'll have never have much to leave. <laughs> Let him be mayor of Middlemarch. Much as he likes. <laughs> Miss Ed! Shall I destroy this letter of Mr. Bowstrode? Sir, yes. I don't want it. I don't want it. It's worth no money to me. <laughs> oh, I, I'm going upstairs for a rest. <laughs> It's a shame you have to stay in this house to be bullied, Mary. Oh, I have an easy life by comparison. I've tried being a teacher and I'm not fit for that. Everything here, I can do as well as anyone could. Perhaps better than some. Rosie, for example. Come, Fred, you have no right to be critical. Well, I couldn't do my duty as a clergyman any more than you could do yours as a school teacher. I think you ought to have a little fellow feeling there, Mary. I never said you ought to be a clergyman. There are other sorts of work. It seems miserable not to resolve on some course and act accordingly. Well, so I could if I had a... If you are to... sure you should not have a fortune. No, I did not say that. You want to quarrel with me. How should I want to quarrel with you? However you may be to other people, you are good to me. Because I like you better than anyone else. But I know you despise me. Yes. I do a little. I suppose a woman is never in love with anyone she has always known. Like a man often is. It is always some new fellow who strikes a girl. Now let me see. I must go back on my experience. There is Juliet. She seems an example of what you say. Oh, but then Ophelia had probably known Hamlet a long while. I don't see how a man can be good for much unless he has some woman to love him dearly. I think the goodness should come before he expects that. Oh, Mary, you know better than that. Women don't love men for their goodness. But if they love them, they never think them bad. Oh, it is hardly fair to say I'm bad. I said nothing at all about you. Mary, I shall never be good for much. If you will not say to me that you love me, if you will not promise to marry me, that is when I am able to marry. Even if I did love you, I would certainly not promise to marry you. I think that's quite wicked, Mary. I mean, if you loved me, then you ought to promise to marry me. On the contrary, I think it would be wicked of me to marry you. Even if I did love you. My father says an idle man ought not to exist, much less be married. Then I'm to blow my brains out. No, I think you would do better to pass your examination. Well, if I did pass my examinations, you would not want me to go into the church. But that is not the question. What I want, you, you have a conscience of your own, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you.
Well done, Rosie. Well done. Thank you, Papa. Oh, come, come, Rosie. One song is not enough to please the company. We can see it here now, Papa. Oh, we shall have to wait a while, gentlemen, to be entertained by another song. Oh, not too long, I hope, Miss Vincy. Well, if I please you, Dr. Lister, that is more than good. Dr. Sprague, my love. Dr. Sprague. Oh, thank you, Miss Vincy. Mr. Vincy, you're not a member of the hospital board. I report as mayor. I resigned. Let me say I was asked to resign. Well, you may ask me why. If you don't care for me to know. The chairman of the hospital board, my brother-in-law, did not hold with certain of my views. About what? My opinion about the chaplain for the new hospital. Oh, I'm sorry. I hear Bulstor has asked you to become director of the new hospital. Yes, he has. Oh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, what is your opinion on this matter of the chaplain? Tyke or fair brother? Well, I know a little of either, but in general, appointments are apt to be made too much a question of personal liking. Or well, sometimes, if you want to get a reform, the only way is to pension off the good fellows whom everybody's fond of. Like, um, like uh, Dr. Sprague and Dr. Minchin, perhaps? I'd hardly be so ill-mannered as to be personal about my senior colleagues, but the same principles apply. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Dr. Lidgate, I hear you're very fond of foreign ideas and a disposition to unsettle what has been settled and forgotten by your elders. Uh, probably so, Dr. Minchin. I take it, Dr. Lidgate, that you will vote with Bulstrode for Tyke. Well, I have no opinion in the matter. Well, what's yours, Dr. Minchin? I go for Fairbrother and the salary that goes with the appointment. You'll be able to meet Fairbrother. He's dropping in for a game of whist. Well, I say it's a crying shame. Fairbrother has worked at the old hospital and for nothing. Now that Bulstrode's giving forty pounds a year to the hospital chaplain, he wants to put in tight. Put forty pounds a year into Fairbrother's pocket and you'll do no harm. He's a good fellow, is Fairbrother. Who takes to evangelical for my taste? Sick people can't bear so much praying and preaching. <clears throat> I think, gentlemen, you're allowing your politics to cause you to neglect the ladies. <laughs> so, so we are. My dear Mrs. Vincy, what a charming dinner you gave us. <laughs> the gentleman of your profession is so serious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when are you going to sing for us again? Oh, I'm too afraid of comparison. You must have had the best singers in Paris. Well, I had very few. My time was taken up with my studies. Huh? Would you tell me about that? I so long to visit them. <laughs> oh, stroud has got him in his pocket, I did. It seems that nobody can live or trade in Middlemarch at what they've got to sing to Bulstrode's tune. Yeah, it is him tune at that. <laughs> well, you will not like us at Middlemarch, I feel sure. You are very stupid. And you've been used to something quite different. I've made up my mind to take Middlemarch as it comes, and to be obliged at the town will take me in the same way. <laughs> well, I certainly found some charms in it which are much greater than I had expected. Oh, you mean the rights towards Tipton and Lowe? Oh, yes, everyone is pleased with that. No, I mean something much nearer to me. <laughs> uh, do you care for dancing at all? I'm not quite sure whether clever men ever dance. I dance with you, if you don't know. Oh, well, I was only going to say that we sometimes have dancing, and I wondered whether you would feel insulted if you were. Not on the condition I mentioned. Oh. Good evening. Well, yes, Mr. Fairbrother. Good evening, Mr. Fairbrother. Oh, good evening, Mr. Fairbrother. You will take tea. Thank you. Evening, Rector. Good evening. Uh, you've met Dr. Lidgett? Yes, we met at Brooks, I think. That's right. How are you finding Middlemarch? I like it very much. Good. Good. Rose, you take Mr. Fairbrother his tea. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, oh, yes. Thank you, Miss Vincent. Would you cut the vicar likes his game of cards? <laughs> Is there any harm in that? None at all. But it's a poor profession when you've got to make up your living by playing whist. Come in. Come in. Pleasant evening. Yes, very. Well, many of your profession don't usually smoke. <laughs> Not of mine either, I suppose. You will hear the pipe alleged against me by Bellstrade and Company, and my game of whist. They don't know how much I enjoy pleasing the devil. <laughs> but you're a collector. Yes, I fancy I've made an exhaustive study of the entomology of this district. I'm going on with the fauna and flora, but at least I've done my insects well. I wear singly and rich in orthoptera. You don't mind my fumigating, huh? <laughs> Not in the least. You have some views on the medical profession, you tell me. Yes. 
Well, I've often said that the fault with the medical profession is in too many doctors being ambitious for themselves and not for medicine. I'm ambitious for medicine. I've no intention of being influenced by other considerations. Well, your intention may be a good deal difficult to carry out. You've not only got the old Adam in yourself. Uh, old Adam? Original sin, the temptation goes all the way through. <laughs> But you have all the descendants of the original Adam who form the society around you. Ah, yes, I know, but if you're true to what you believe in, people will accept you at your own value. Then you must be sure of having the value, and you must keep yourself independent. Very few men can do that. Well, I made up my mind when I was a student in Paris that I was going to remain independent. That's why I determined not to try anything in London for a good many years at least. Well, in the country, one can follow one's course more quietly. Yes, yeah, well... You've made a good start. You're in the right profession, the work you feel most fit for. Some people miss that and return too late. But you must not be too sure of keeping your independent. You mean married? No, 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 not altogether. A good wife, a good unworldly woman, can really help a man and keep him more independent. Then why have you never married? They say that poverty keeps a man nearer to God. Well, most clergy certainly have that qualification. Unless a clergyman has the right patronage, he must accept that he has little future in the worldly sense. That, of course, is why he accepts his calling. <laughs> or perhaps I should say, if he accepts his calling, he must accept the poverty. Now, your profession and mine seem to have this much in common. Both need dedication. I certainly have very little to offer a wife. But I cannot say I do not wish to marry. Is there a young lady? I've often thought that Mary Garth could bring me happiness. I believe you've met her. Yes, she seems very quiet. Oh, don't you believe it. She has a lively sense of fun, which would be an antidote to my seriousness. Dorothea Brooke, there would have been a wife for you. I have no thought of marrying. I intend to make my way first. A girl with a modest fortune to help you in your work. And a girl who recognizes the imperfect social order of things and believes they must be changed. I find her rather too intense for comfort. Well, I should have grown out of that direction in life. But now, I doubt if Casabon will have had erection. He's too wrapped up in the past. <laughs> I don't think he even knows that he has a parish. <laughs> you seem concerned for me. We middle marchers are not so tame as you take us for. We have our intrigues and our parties. I'm a party man, for example, and Bulstrode is another. Oh, no. I'm not having any part in petty politics. How can you avoid it? If you vote for me, you will offend Bulstrode. Oh, don't know that I need mind that. And he is chairman of the hospital board. Exactly. Aunt Bulstrode. Ah, you're alone, I see. Why, well, yes, Aunt. I'm pleased about that, my dear. I just heard something about you that has surprised me very much. Hmm? And what is that, Aunt? Uh, I can hardly believe it. That you're engaged without my knowing it, without your father's telling me. Well, I'm not engaged, Aunt. Well, how is it everyone says so, then? That it is the whole town's talk? Well, then. it seems that the town knows what I do not. Oh, my. Yeah, be careful what you're saying. Do not despise your neighbours, so. But I can think it must be some stupid story of Fred's. Remember, you're turned 22 now, and you'll have no fortune. Your father will not be able to spare you anything. My Uncle Featherstone may do something for me, as indeed he will for Fred. Oh, my dear. I should not rely on that. Mr. Lickett is a stranger in Middlemarch. He's very intellectual and clever. I know there's a great attraction in that. I like talking to such men myself. And your uncle finds him very useful. Oh, my uncle finds him useful, but I must not think of marrying him. The profession here is a very poor one, Rosie. To be sure, this life is not everything. But it's seldom a medical man has true religious views. There's too much pride of intellect. And you are not fit to marry a poor man, Rosie. Dr. Lidgett is not a poor man. He has very high connections. Well, he told your father himself that he's poor. But that is simply because he is used to people who have a high style of living. Yes, 
you must not think of living in a high style. Then it's really true. You are thinking of Mr. Lidgett. Oh, Rosamond, be open. Has Mr. Lidgett really made an offer to you? Excuse me, Aunt, but I would rather not speak on the subject. And you would not give your heart to a man without a decided prospect, I trust, my dear. And you know, young Ned Plimdale is most anxious to pay court to you. The Plimdales have an excellent business. We were certainly hoping that you would marry Ned. I should certainly never give my heart to Ned Plimdale. If I loved, I should love at once and without change. I see how it is, my dear. You've allowed your heart to be engaged without return. I knew indeed, Aunt. Then you are quite confident that Mr. Lidgett has a serious attachment to you. I like this scheme of things you've drawn up for the hospital. I like it. Thank you, Mr. Beaufort. I knew I was right when I asked you to be the director. Thank you. I've warned you your appointment is not likely to be popular with the other medical men. Oh, I'm aware of that. And they are the senior medical practitioners. And by right, it's one of them I should have asked. And you are, of course, aware that the appointment is an honorary one. That uh, there is no salary attached. It's the usual practice with hospital service. It is the opportunity to carry out the ideas I care most about. I have my practice, which should be sufficient for my needs. I hope I can announce your appointment at the meeting of the medical board tomorrow. I'll give you my answer in the morning. Brooke has invited the meeting to his house. It's a compliment I can pay him. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon, Nicholas. I was not told you were engaged. Come in, Harriet. Good Come morning, Mr. Bolsho. Good morning, Mr. Lidgett. I have a matter to attend to. You can entertain Mr. Lidgett for a few minutes, Harriet. And how are you finding Middlemarch, Mr. Lidgett? Oh, I like Middlemarch. And your practice, is it flourishing? You have a high reputation, I hear. As uh, that, Mrs. Bolton, I cannot say. I only know that many of Dr. Peacock's patients seem to be calling in Dr. Minchin or Dr. Sprague. <laughs> Where snow was strained in the middle March, Mr. Lucas. In a few months, you'll be thought of as being here from the beginning of time. <laughs> I'm sure, Mrs. Bolton. It's difficult for the young people to settle in life. It's difficult, too, for the young ladies. The young ladies? Of middle March. Especially if the young lady has great attractions. A gentleman may pay her attention for the pleasure of the moment, and a young lady may think he's serious and discourage other suitors. On the other hand, a man must be a great idiot if he goes about the notion that he may not admire a young lady lest she should fall in love with him. May I speak frankly, Mr. Lidgett? I think you are, Mrs. Bolstrad. Oh, Mr. Lidgett, you know very well what your advantages are in the eyes of a young lady. You have a family background. You have been educated in London and Paris. I have no intentions towards Miss Vincy, if that is what you fear. I admire her, but I have no intentions towards her. Good day. If you must play the flute, I wish you'd find a dancing bear for company. He may be able to endure your effort. When next any man makes love to you, Miss Rosamond, I will tell him how obliging you are. What is your meaning, Fred? I mean that Dr. Lidgate has been invited to dinner and has refused. <laughs> Dr. Lidgate, no doubt, has many engagements. Exactly, Miss Rosamond. When next any man makes love to you, I will tell him how obliging you are. You would do better, Fred, to do as father wishes and return to your studies. I am studying. Instructor on the flute. <laughs> you know, Fred, I really don't know what will become of you if Uncle Featherstone does nothing for you. I don't know what will become of you, Rosie, for you have refused all the eligible young men of your own class who could have supported your notions of ladylike behavior. <laughs> Let me send for some tea. Oh, no, I can't stay. I wanted a word with you before the hospital committee meeting at five. Well, then come back and have some dinner with me. Sit down. Oh, no, thank you. I have work to do. I mean to give up going out in the evenings. What? You're going to get lashed to the mast, eh? 
Well, if you don't mean to be won by the sirens, you're right to take precautions in time. Oh. I think you are in need of a confessor, but don't mention that popish word in front of Bolstrad. I'm a proud man. I resent the subjection which is being forced upon me. You will not offend me if you vote against my appointment. I don't translate my own convenience into other people's duties. What is there against Bolstrode? Well, I didn't say there was anything against it. Oh, but others do. Bolstrode has a lot of power. He knows the financial secrets of most people in Middlemarch and can touch the strings of credit. And he has gathered to himself the chief share in administering the town's charities. But his charity is given as a reward for the repentance of sin. His enemies say that the clergy in Middlemarch do God's will in God's way, and that Bulstrode does God's will in Bulstrode. Well, he seems to have good ideas about hospitals, as to his religious notions. <laughs> as Voltaire said, incantations will destroy a flock of sheep if administered with a certain amount of arsenic. <laughs> now, I don't mind about his incantations. Well, I do. Bulstrode does more to make his neighbours uncomfortable than to make them better. He looks on mankind as a doomed carcass, which is to nourish him for heaven. What reason does Bulstrode have for not wanting you as chaplain? But I don't teach his opinions, what he calls spiritual religion. I shall be glad of the 40 pounds, but let us dismiss that. If you vote for your incantations, man, you are not to cut me in consequence. I can't spare you. You are a sort of circumnavigator come to settle amongst us and will keep up my belief that in the provinces a better kind of life can be found. If patience leave him, it's because he makes too big a noise. It's common sense. If a man's ill, he likes a treatment he knows about. It's no good Lydgate telling him what they do in Paris. He's just the right fool for Bolstow's purpose. I spoke well of him in the town. I gave him welcome. Medical theories for medical schools, they don't belong to Middlemarch. A man doesn't know what he's about. He speaks of serving the profession, but the profession ought to stick together. That's my rule. He'll change his tune when he finds he got no practice. I do hope your time is here. Oh. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, gentlemen. Good day to you. It's going in with a labour that beats me. Ah, the layman who thinks he knows more than the medical. Well, at least we've got book on our side. <laughs> <laughs> Allow me to express my pleasure in seeing you here, gentlemen. Now, shall we be seated? Ah, here you're putting up for Parliament, Brooke. On the Whitside. side. Yes, 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 yes. I am meaning to stand. Yeah, the Tories have had middle march for many years now. You Tories are against reform, I know, but I intend to sit upon the independent... May I declare the meeting open? Well, gentlemen, you know the main purpose of the meeting. We have to elect the chaplain of the new hospital. Cadwallader and Casabon have declined nomination, and that leaves Tyke and Fairbrother. You might like to give your views first, Brooke. Hmm. Oh. Well, this is my first attention to hospital affairs, but I have a strong interest in anything that is for the benefit of Middlemarch, and... Uh, I do consider that a chaplain uh, with a salary, uh, with, with, with a salary, mind you, is a very good thing. Uh, so I am happy to be able to vote for uh, Mr. Tice, eh? who I understand is a good man, uh, apostolic and, and eloquent. It seems you're crammed with one side of the question, Brooke. You don't seem to know that one of the worthiest men we have has done duty as chaplain the old hospital for years without pay and that Mr. Tyke has proposed to supersede him. I believe Mr. Fairbrother is rather too fond of the card table. Indeed, I understand he plays cards for money. You've been listening to Fairbrother's enemies, Brooke. I trust there's no personal enmity here, Mr. Fairbrother. I swear there is. Gentlemen, <laughs> the merits of the question may be very easily stated. If any gentleman has not been fully informed, I can recapitulate the considerations that could weigh on either side. I can't see the good of that. I suppose we all know who we mean to vote for. No matter what to do, justice isn't going to wait for the last minute to hear both sides of the question. I've got no time to lose, and I propose that we put the matter to the vote at once. Well, well, well you have my vote, Mr. Tice. Fair brother. Fair brother. I think you know my vote. 
type. I perceive the votes are equally divided at present. There is a casting vote to be given. It is yours, Mr. Lincoln. Oh, the thing is settled. We all know how Mr. Lidgate will vote. You seem to speak with some offensive meaning, Dr. Minchin. I only mean that you're expected to vote with Mr. Balstone. You regard that meaning as offensive? It is offensive. However, I shall not desist from voting with Mr. Balstone on that account. Pike. <laughs> 